My name is Nicholas Hud. Okay, what, what do you do? I am a chemist at Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta, Georgia. Okay, and are we alone? No. Okay, why do you say that? I would say that because of statistics. There are so many planets in our universe. I have a hard time accepting the possibility that life has not started in another place. Okay, but there are two things that go into this. One is the number of planets, the other is the probability of forming on one of those planets. Yes, yes. So tell us about that. Well, I have been studying the origin of nucleic acids, DNA and RNA, for about 20 years now. And the more I've studied these molecules, the more I'm convinced that the chemistry that gave rise to these molecules is quite robust and likely to be occurring at many places in the universe. So be more specific about the word robust. Well, what I mean by robust is that it looks like RNA probably started with a molecule a little different. That's what the hypothesis that we're working on. And the, what we would call a proto-RNA molecule, the molecule that came before RNA, has components that look like they would have survived for a very long time on the surface of the Earth. That's what, one of the things that I say about being robust, that they're, you might say, hardy molecules, that once they're generated, they'll stay around for quite a long time. And the reactions that would have brought them together to make RNA, RNA is a very big, long molecule, what we call polymer. Um, those reactions look like they're quite easy to carry out. They would be mostly driven by wet, dry cycles. And so if you have a planet that is in what we like to call the habitable zone, not too hot, not too cold, um, and it has a water cycle, and it has an atmosphere like what we had on the early Earth that would generate uh, molecules that we think would have been on the early Earth, I think it's quite likely that uh, life would start. Is the question, are we alone, an important question? I think it's, I would say it's a natural question. Uh, it's a natural question that goes along with what is the origin of life? Um, why are we here? What does it mean to be alive? I think that, that it's a natural part of human consciousness, the, the, the realization of our place in this world makes it natural for us to ask, are there other worlds, are there other humans or other living creatures on other planets and other galaxies? I, I think that it's a natural question for us. So the 50% at least of the population who don't care about this question are unnatural? Uh, I think you would have to ask them a few deeper questions. Um, I would say that more like 100% will at least wondered about the question. I would say that if you have a statistics that says that 50% don't care, I'd ask them another question of why don't you care? And I'm going to guess that a number of them will respond that it doesn't really matter because we won't ever know or won't change my life. But I think that they've probably still pondered the question. Oh, I'm wondering how old this question is. I mean, there are a lot of people today who are living at the brink of poverty, you know, they're struggling to survive. Look, they're f f finding food is important and finding a mate and having children are important. But the question, are we alone, sometimes does, it's just such a low priority for them that it never bubbles up to the top. Uh, I'd, I'd be surprised. I, I, think, I think you're right that depending upon your situation in life, you will have more or less time to think about what might be considered philosophical questions. This, this is very true. Um, and so it might not be high on somebody's list of priorities uh, if they are very concerned every day where their next meal is coming from. I think that that's very true. Um, but I would venture to say that almost all people have thought of the question of, of what is our place in the universe um, or place in the world or how are we as humans 
related to other life forms? I, th I think that that's a question that's similar to this question of are we alone? It's how are we related to other living creatures? So in the question, are we alone, what did you understand by the word we? Uh, I understand that as we as humans. Um, but I think that the bigger question, so to speak, about are we alone, broadens it out to is there life somewhere else in the universe besides just on the Earth? Well, isn't the answer to the question, are we humans alone in the universe? Obviously, no, because we're not alone on Earth. That's a good point. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's also why I was saying that I think that the question of are we alone is related to how are we um, connected and related to other living forms on Earth? Because I do think that that's part of the same question of what does it mean to be human with respect to what does it mean to be you know, any biological organism? But I asked you, are we alone? You said no. And you said, I asked you, what do you think about we? And you said humans. Yes. And then you said, well, would you agree that we humans are not alone on Earth? Yes. So um, then the answer is we're not alone. But you weren't thinking of that. I wasn't, no. <laughs> that question, are we alone, would probably be because it's been asked so many times in the context of life on other planets. I, I immediately thought of it in that context. Okay. And uh, have you seen a UFO? No, I have not. Uh, have you ever been abducted? No. You ever talked to people who had seen UFOs? Yes. And well, they thought that they had. And what do you say to them? I say that I've never seen one, and most cases that I've heard being investigated have come up with a answer that doesn't involve travel from another planet. Some people say that we don't know anything about the origin of life, but obviously you've been doing it, working on it for 20 years, so you've made some kind of progress. What kind of progress has humanity made in, let's say, the last 20 years towards understanding the origin of life on Earth? I think we know a lot about the origin of life now. Uh, there are two approaches to the origin of life, what we call top-down and bottom-up approaches. The top-down is an approach where you take information from life as it exists on Earth today, uh, information that's in biological organisms, information that's in the genome of biological organisms, and you try to use that to reconstruct the earliest forms of life for which we have a record in life that's on Earth today. And I think that there's been tremendous advances in those areas in the last 20 years. We have a very good idea, uh, I would say, um, what the earliest organisms uh, look like, so to speak, uh, almost four billion years ago on a molecular level. I think we have quite a good idea about that. Um, the other approach, bottom up, um, starts with chemistry that would have been occurring on the prebiotic Earth, that is, before life had emerged. I think we've made some significant advances there as well. Uh, we can take molecules that we believe were on the prebiotic Earth. I think we have very good evidence that they were because we find them in meteorites that fall to Earth that are about the age of the Earth and we've discovered reactions that can take these small molecules and stitch them together into larger molecules that start to resemble those that we find in biological organisms. So I think if you take those two advances together, I'd say we're getting quite close to what could be a continuous or contiguous story that starts with small molecules on the prebiotic Earth and advances all the way to the first cellular organisms and beyond, to multicellular organisms. I've heard that uh, we think that RNA preceded DNA. If that's the case, why do you think that? Why do people think that? Do you agree with that? Not necessarily. Um, I don't think that DNA came before RNA. I think if you are asking uh, which one is older, RNA or DNA, um, I would definitely side with RNA, and the reason for that is that the main difference between RNA and DNA uh, is that the sugar in DNA is deoxyribose, and the sugar that is in the backbone of RNA is ribose. And it's easier to see 
how ribose would have been made before we had biological organisms. And the reaction to convert ribose into deoxyribose is actually quite a complicated reaction that I think required the development of enzymes. And so I think that, that was a little bit later. Um, so you do think RNA preceded DNA? I, well, here's where I'm going to say that I don't think so because I think that they may have come about at the same time because I think that they're a descendant of a common ancestor. I think that there was a molecule before DNA and a molecule before RNA. We could call it proto-RNA. And I think that that molecule evolved and at some point it split into two uh, distinct polymers, which are DNA and RNA. And um, all life, does all life on Earth have a common origin? Yes. What's the evidence for that? The evidence is that there are a set of molecules that are common uh, between all of life. For example, uh, amino acids. The 20 amino acids that make up our coded proteins are universal um, across all living organisms. We're using the same. And to a very good approximation, the genetic code is the same across all living organisms. And based upon models for evolution, when we look at, say, how genes change over time, uh, if we take that information and we extrapolate it back from all known organisms, it seems to point to the same place what we would call a universal common ancestor. Do viral capsules and structure of viruses have, uh, are made of uh, amino acids? Yes, the capsids are... the same are, 20 amino yes, acids? Yes, the capsids of, the, of most viruses are made of proteins and they contain amino acids that are coded uh, in the same way that cells make proteins. You said most proteins. Are the capsids of some not made out of well, proteins? Some, some have um, lipids as part of their membranes, and so they're kind of a mix. They're not just a protein shell. I see, and they get those lipids from their hosts. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Now, uh, Carl Woese has talked about a Darwinian threshold. And sometimes we try to define life with, oh, when you start to have Darwinian selection or Darwinian evolution. So I'm, tr I'm confused about exactly how this, it, it probably wasn't a phase change, or how do you em envision the beginning of Darwinism, Darwinian evolution? The definition, as I understand it, of Darwinian evolution uh, is that we have what is also called this doctrine of descent, which is that organisms that are on Earth today are descended from previous organisms, which evolved further. Uh, and it seems that we had simpler organisms early that became more complex. And so if you take that picture, that mechanism for evolution, and you try to run it all the way back, then it seems to point to a single early type of cell that gives rise to all life. What Carl Woese says is that it doesn't look like that is the case because that would say that all of life is descended from some early single cell, so to speak. And that would give you somewhat of a, you might say, a linear transition, say, from early life to what we have today. But when you look at the data, the earliest, say, fingerprints, you might say, of what life looks like, it doesn't look like it's one cell that through time is evolving towards where we are today. It looks like there were many starting, say, suborganisms. We don't even have a real good name for these. He calls them supermolecular aggregates or something. So they weren't even cellular organisms to start with. But it looks like on the early Earth, the first organism wasn't really a single cell, but maybe almost a distributed gel-like substance that covered the surface. Maybe it was even the size of a continent. And there we have a, a nascent form of life that in perhaps different geological locations, it's developing different components that are going to be needed net later to have cellular life. This looks very different than Darwinian evolution then because it's not like organisms competing with each other. 
it's almost like they're collaborating with each other. They're sharing parts that they have that at some point they get to a level of sophistication that they turn into cellular life. And I, I think that that goes along with what he's calling the Darwinian threshold. It's almost where this chemistry, this prebiotic chemistry that is evolving in a different mechanism converts to what we would recognize now as biology. But both cooperation and competition are part of Darwinian selection. And if that's the case, then how did these aggregates uh, evolve the ability to cooperate? Well, I don't think that they necessarily evolved the ability to cooperate. I think it's actually the nature of the molecules and the physical environment in which they were in naturally promotes this type of cooperation rather than competition. Okay. And you've said several, several things that make me think that you think that complexity in the, in, among life forms is increasing. Some people agree with that. Uh, but I tell my students sometimes, well, uh, we multicellular eukaryotes think we're complex, but we're morphologically complex, but chemically we're like a monoculture compared to bacteria. And so I say, if you're looking for uh, chemical complexity, look at the bacteria. If you're looking for morphological complexity, look at the multicellular eukaryotes. What, what is your opinion on that? Well, I would agree with you. And in fact, when I teach biochemistry, um, I also say to my students that we think we are at the apex of evolution. And I say, well, when it comes to biochemistry, we are nothing compared to a plant. And, and I say, if you want to test that uh, statement that I made, um, try standing out in the sun and just drinking water and sticking your feet in the ground and see how long you last. A plant can do that and thrive, mm -hmm. which tells you that the plant at a chemical level is much more sophisticated than we are. They can make all of the molecules that they need from light, air, water, and trace nutrients from the soil. That's amazing. So I would agree with you that at a molecular level, um, other organisms are more sophisticated than us with respect to the chemistry that they can do. Now you didn't use the word complex. No. I have a little bit of a problem with complexity because yeah, it's a little hard to define what it means to be more or less complex. Okay. And have you seen the movie uh, Contact? No, I haven't. It's Carl Sagan's movie. Well, anyway, in, Car in the movie, Carl, uh, there's a Jodie Foster, the character who plays Jill Tarter's alter ego. And, uh, and they, they ask her, are we alone in the universe? And she says, well, if we are, it's an awful waste of space. <laughs> so what do you think of that? Uh, I would say if we are alone, then there must be something more to the original life that I'm not... I'm not seeing because the chemistry that I'm seeing right now that looks like it could give rise to life looks relatively simple and so I just don't see why it can't happen on other planets. Well if it can happen, if it's so simple, why hasn't, haven't people made it in the laboratory? That's a really good question and what I would say is it speaks to how difficult chemistry is. Well, then it might be hard elsewhere. I never cease to be amazed by how uh, the change of one atom in a molecule can completely change the properties of the molecule. Wait, wait, um, but you, I thought you said just the opposite about five minutes ago. So straighten me out. Okay, so I think that for a long time scientists have been a little too focused on the molecules that are inside living organisms today. I think that life started with molecules that are slightly different than those that we have inside us today. So if we take our molecules that are in living organisms and we just make minor changes, sometimes just changing one atom, uh, we, and we've done this in my lab and in the center that I'm part of, the Center for Chemical Evolution, we just change the molecules that much and we have molecules that undergo reactions that look much more lifelike than the molecules that we have inside of us. So it seems that the molecules that we have have changed with the advancement of life. They've evolved along with organisms. So life is advancing? Well, life has advanced a lot, I think, from the chemistry that started it. Uh, there's still traces, say, of the molecules. I think that they still have shape, features, functions similar <coughs> to the ones that started on life on Earth, 
um, but they're not exactly the same. And that's why I say chemistry is difficult because changing one molecule can change the property uh, of the whole, changing one atom can change the property of a whole molecule. Um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't molecules very closely related to the ones inside of us that you know, wouldn't have been able to start life. But what if we go back to the, I don't know, very beginning, whatever that means, and just change one molecule, and maybe the origin of life on Earth depends on a, a very rare change of a molecule somewhere at the bottom? I don't think that that's the case. Uh, I know you don't think it's yeah. the case, but why not? Why the, not? the reason I don't think that's the case is that uh, I would say that uh, with my collaborators now, uh, we've come up with, I'd say, at least three different molecules that look like good candidates for early components of the first, say, lifelike organisms. And these molecules are not only similar to the ones that we have inside of us, but they are found in model prebiotic reactions along with uh, the, the biological molecules that people have found in such reactions. What are those molecules? Well, for instance, um, hydroxy acids. So uh, we know that proteins are made up of amino acids and if you take the nitrogen, which the name amino and amino acid comes from, and you change that to an oxygen, you have a hydroxy acid. Now hydroxy acids are also inside of us today. Um, we don't think of them as much as the amino acids, um, but they're important. And they are found in reactions such as the Miller-Urey experiment that really started all of say, prebiotic chemistry work in the 1950s, uh, the same chemical reactions that make amino acids also make hydroxy acids. And we find that if you mix hydroxy acids with amino acids, you make peptides very easily. So that's another example. Just changing one atom makes the chemistry much easier. If I gave you $100 billion with the caveat you have to spend it to try to answer the question, to help answer the question, are we alone, how would you spend it? Uh, to, wow. Uh, if I had that much money, and that was the question, are we alone? I would, I would, have, I would approach it in two ways. Um, one is that I would continue with and increase the amount of effort that's going into understanding the origin of life, because I think that understanding the origin of life on Earth is the best way for us to develop um, hypotheses for which molecules are those that started life and could start life on other plants. So th that would give us the clues for what to look for. With that amount of money, um, I would also be uh, definitely um, inclined to advance uh, space travel and remote detection of molecules in the universe. So I think that those two parts go hand in hand in asking the question. Would you invest in um, microscopes to look for nano aliens? Uh, no, I don't think I would do that. Um, I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of techniques that tell us what molecules we have at, the, at say, um, well, molecular level. You know, uh, it's looking for morphologies, um, like you say, like a microscope to look for nano beings and that. That could be a tricky business because I think then um, we have to understand um, you know, what three-dimensional features should be associated with life. I think that's kind of difficult. Um, and maybe it's coming at this from a chemist perspective. Um, I think we're better off trying to detect molecules, uh, the bonds between these molecules, um, and use that as clues to whether life is present on a planet. Um, you said earlier that you don't think we're alone in the universe, and yet, uh, we don't. We haven't made contact with aliens and spaceships. And if you do the calculation like Fermi did, he said, "Well, we have plenty of time to go back and forth in the age of the galaxy to colonize all these planets, and yet we don't see any evidence for these aliens." So you must have some type of solution to Fermi's paradox that's consistent with believing that we're not alone in the universe. I actually think it's a relatively simple answer when we look at. Um, the vastness of space. You know, although there are so many galaxies and I think countless planets out there, uh, the time that it would take to travel to us from one of those planets is, is still a long time. And I, I think that just statistically, 
uh, if there is other intelligent life out there, uh, the odds that they would have been able to travel to us you know, over these great distances is, is probably still pretty small. So that doesn't detract at all uh, from my opinion that I think that there's life other places in the universe. I think that the likelihood that there's life in other places in the universe is much, much greater than the likelihood that life in another place in the universe, uh, if they were able to develop the technology to travel vast uh, distance in the space, would have landed on our planet. That's all. So what about the probability of once you have, let's suppose that you're right and there's life on many, many planets in our galaxy and elsewhere in the universe, what's the probability that that life evolves technology and rocket ships and well, radio a, telescopes? Right, that's another, say, a level of probability that we would have to calculate in. And I think that that, you know, that is a very good question because if we look at life on Earth, life has existed on Earth for about three and a half billion years. And we would say life that can develop the technology to detect life on other planets has only been in existence you know, for the last, say, million years or, or certainly less than that. We only have technology developed on Earth that's sufficient within the last maybe 100 to 200 years. Uh, that's you know, a really small length of time compared to how long life has been present on Earth. So I think it's very possible um, that there is much more life out there than there is life with the capabilities to travel or send signals. Um, now in the Arthur C. Clarke famously said, any sufficiently advanced technology will be, in, will be indistinguishable from magic. But a guy named Carl Schroeder, I think in Germany, said, no, Arthur, you're wrong. Any sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from nature. Um, you have a view on that? Uh? I think that... Um there are, say, signs of life on Earth that we can associate um, with the presence of living organisms, say, if we were outside the Earth. Um, and it's, it's a difficult question. Um, you know, what signals would be present on a planet that would say, this is, this is from life? Um, I think that those that study the evolution of planets um, have some very nice models um, that show what uh, the atmosphere, uh, what the surface of a planet would look like uh, in the absence of life. But it doesn't mean that, um, that we know exactly what a signal will look like that says that life is present on a planet. And so um, I think that uh, if this is in the context of what should we look for to find life, um, I think that we need to approach it in two ways. We need to understand the origin of life on Earth to give us clues to what to look for. But I don't think that we should be so narrowly focused that uh, when we come up with some ideas for what molecules are signals of life, that we only look for those molecules or those signs of life. I think we need to do the basic observations as well and to look for um, aberrations um, from what we're expecting to see, you might say, on planets. In the question, are we alone, there's a word alone. And if somebody, if I've talked to a lot of people about this, and they, many people say if we find life elsewhere, like in the plume of Enceladus that has evolved independently of life here, they say we'd still be alone. And the reason is they think to be not alone, you have to have a sentient being, an advanced civilization you can talk to and talk about, I don't know, the meaning of life or something. So if they find microbes, they say, oh, we're still alone because uh, I can't talk to it. What is your take on that? I I can understand you know, both arguments on that, and, and it, it does depend upon your interpretation of the word alone. Um, I would admit that there would be a different feeling if we found sentient beings on another planet. Um, 
than if we found life forms that would represent, say, you know, non-thinking, non-cognizant life. Um, but I do think, though, that if we found any signs of life, in whatever form it is, it would change the nature of that question, are we alone? It would immediately shift it from, are we alone, as in, are we the only living creature, to are we the only sentient beings? It would immediately change that. And, mm -hmm. I, and I think that that's, that's a major change in that question. Okay, now here's the emotional part of the interview. You're supposed to take some deep breaths, close your eyes, turn off the rational side of your brain. I'm going to ask you, what kind of aliens would you like to find emotionally? I think this still comes from my uh, scientific side. Uh oh, I asked to talk to the emotional side. Right. I'm get in touch with that emotional <laughs> Nick Hood. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I, I would probably be most excited if we found a type of life that fit all of our criteria for, for life but it had a completely different way of harvesting and utilizing energy. To me, that would be the most fascinating thing. I know some would rather see an advanced civilization in that, but, but you know, I come at this from a chemist, chemical chemistry perspective, and to me, that would be just so exciting to see, see life utilizing a completely different energy force. That sounds like an intellectual excitement. I was explicitly asking for an emotional kind of reaction. <laughs> that would still elicit an emotional reaction okay. to me because I would be so excited to see okay. that. All right. Do you think we're living inside of an alien? Uh, well... You're kind of like my, the neurons of your brain don't know they're inside your brain, yeah, right? Well, my son has told me... a. a sci-fi sci stories about that and us being parasites on a giant organism uh -huh. and that, um, but I don't think that's the case, no. I, I, I think the way we perceive the world is, is quite accurate, that we are on this planet in our solar system and we are living beings that have evolved from life that started about three and a half billion years ago. Well, several philosophers have made the, made the argument that we're probably living inside of a, of a simulation based on the idea that, well, if you have life, you have intelligent life, and we're making simulations. Our simulations are getting better and better. If that's what happens to life in general, they get smart and then they start making simulations, and then you get billions of years of progress making the simulations, and it seems that most of the life forms then would be inside of simulations. That's the argument. What do you think? I don't think so. Because? Uh, you don't like it? And you haven't seen any glitches? Uh, that might be part of it. Um, also, again, going back to being a chemist, you know, I can see the molecules, so to speak, and there are molecules inside. There are molecules inside these simulations. Yeah, yeah. I, I just uh, don't see any reason to believe it's not how we perceive it as a physical uh, universe. Some people think the answer is well. So what? If we are, what difference does it make? <laughs> <laughs> well, and and I do think that some people live in what might be a simulation <laughs> because you know, our minds have advanced to such a level that we can, quote, create our own reality sometimes. Brains are too big. Huh? Right. So sometimes you know, maybe we're uh, too smart for our own good or maybe that's the better place to be is to kind of alter reality and how we think about it. But as far as the, say, global picture of life on Earth, I don't think it's a simulation. Now you probably have spoken to the public or students about the question, are we alone, at least informally, and what do you think are the, the biggest misconceptions about this question? Uh, I've actually been pleasantly surprised when I talk to people in the public uh, about their understanding and their curiosity about possibility of life on other planets. And I don't think they've had such misconceptions. I think if anything, the misconceptions are that we've been contacted already or that we have evidence of aliens landing on Earth. Um, those that say that, I think that that's 
Now, that may be a misinterpretation of past events on Earth. Um, but most people in the public that I've talked to seem to have a similar opinion that there's probably life on other planets, but not necessarily in our solar system further away, and that that life isn't necessarily identical to us. I think that that's pretty generally accepted among the public. As is E.T. and Yoda and all the productions of Hollywood. So you, you, I didn't hear any, I guess coming from L.A., you wouldn't complain about the propaganda that comes out of Hollywood about the yeah, types of E.T. E. we should expect? I think that uh, there's a place for that, and it's very entertaining. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. And so you don't think it, it uh, encroaches on our ability to think more realistically about extraterrestrials? Not at all. If, if anything, I think that uh, science fiction has increased the public's desire to learn more about science. Uh, that's, that's, been, that's, that's been my experience. Okay, um, so the misleading nature is overcompensated by the enthusiasm that it engenders them. Yeah, I, yeah, I, or more I, I think that most people that, that enjoy science fiction um, are able to separate the fiction from reality. Um, but I do think, though, that those that like science fiction are enthusiastic about science advancing to the point that they could, or their children or their grandchildren, could experience some things that they see in science fiction movies. And so in that way, I think it's good. I think it gives, the, you know, gives us as a society, as a people, uh, something, so to speak, to look forward to. Of do you have any possibilities? Do you have any advice for the students who are watching these videos who are thinking, oh, maybe I'll become an astrobiologist? Uh, sure. Uh, study plenty of math. Okay. <laughs> My, uh, uh, that's the advice I give to almost anybody that's going into science, regardless of what it is. Uh -huh. um, I find that uh, if you want to be an astronomer, a physicist, a biologist, a chemist, a, you know, ecologist, anything. Um, I find that math is valuable and transferable and it's something that some people shy away from. And, but what I find is that no matter what your interests are, uh, the more math you know, the better. So it doesn't, I'm not saying you have to become the world's expert in math, but even just taking an extra class here or there could help you out. Okay. And uh, final question, are we alone? No. And why do you think that? Because I think the chemistry that gave life gave rise to life on Earth is probably happening right now and has happened for many years on other planets in the universe. And the reason why we can't get it to happen again? We'll get there. Okay. okay.